Hello again and welcome to Rule of Life, a sermon series all about building rhythms and habits into your ordinary lives, your everyday lives, uh, rhythms and habits that will fortify and form your faith. Now, why would we be doing this series? Well, let me ask this. Who out there does not want to grow spiritually this year and who out there realizes that spiritual growth does not happen automatically? Or let me ask it this way. Who out there doesn't realize that growing in godliness or the pursuit of Christ-likeness is actually the goal of our lives And yet at the same time, that that pursuit is hindered by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And lastly, let me ask you this. Who out there doesn't realize deep down inside that despite the craziness around us, these uncertain, unhinging times, that despite that there is a way of living that is calm, composed, and anchored. And yet, who also realizes that those same crazy circumstances are the ones that upended us last year, and who is sitting there now this year going, I don't want the same thing to happen to me this year. That's why rule of life So if you're unfamiliar with the phrase rule of life, let me explain what that means Uh, because it can sound quite intimidating, like a rule. uh, So here's what it means. A rule of life is, is a simple list of habits that we build into our daily lives, habits that include some of the spiritual disciplines like prayer, like reading your Bible, like fasting, like gathering together. But it takes these spiritual disciplines and works them into our everyday lives in unique ways designed specifically for the unique pressures that we found ourselves living in today. So what we're not talking about over the next six, seven weeks, we're not, it's not a series on prayer and on scripture and on fasting, although those will come up. It's a series, six weeks, covering six areas of your life that face six unique sets of pressures and therefore six habits or rhythms designed to fortify your faith amidst these pressures and hopefully not just fortify them, but that your faith may flourish and thrive, that it may be positively, spiritually formed this year because whether you realize it or not spiritual formation is something that is happening around us all the time so for example one of the oldest examples that we have of a rule of life goes back to the old testament figure of daniel so daniel as you might remember was a a, a israelite exiled from jerusalem into babylon and daniel all of a sudden finds himself as a young man in, in, this, in this different, unfamiliar surroundings, surroundings in Babylon that are completely just not conducive to the flourishing of his faith as a man of God. And also Daniel in the king's court with a unique set of pressures being brought to bear. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, what they were trying to do is brainwash Daniel, try to lure him into the Babylon way that as an influential figure in his nation, he might lead them that way. So he has Daniel in an unfamiliar surrounding with a unique set of pressures to assimilate to Babylonian culture. What does Daniel do? And so we read, well, Daniel develops what we would call a rule of life. So he starts out by fasting from from anything except for vegetables and water. And he commits to praying three times a day. Now, that's what Daniel needed to do 
back then. I mean, the fasting was a resistance to the luxury of the king's court. It was trying to whine and dine Daniel, so he had to resist that. That was Daniel's rule of life that sustained him, that fortified his faith in those times. We're not there now. We're not exiles living in Babylon. So our habits and rhythms and the rule of life for us will thankfully not necessarily include needing to become a vegetarian, right? But make no mistake, though, we are still living right now like exiles in an unfamiliar culture that is not conducive to the flourishing of our faith, also with a unique set of pressures that are trying to assimilate us into the worldly culture around us. We're like Daniel. It's a different set of pressures, but the same struggle. So we need our own Rosebank Union rule of life for us living in Joburg and beyond in 2021. So, six weeks, six areas of our lives, crucial areas of our lives, six unique sets of pressure that we face here and now, and six practices. And the dream or the hope is that this year as a church community, we commit to these six habits, to this uniquely designed rule of life, so that come what may this year, when it comes to December, we'll find that our faith has been strengthened. We've fortified our faith and that it has in fact flourished despite whatever this year brings at us. So I want to kick off our series this morning by looking at some principles of spiritual formation. This idea that we are either growing or not growing in our faith amidst these worldly pressures. I want to kick that off by having a look at a passage of Scripture that for me, for as long as I can remember, whenever this subject has come up, this passage has been central to the discussion of spiritual Formation. So here we go, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 to 11. So Pastor Ndaba did read it for us earlier, but I want to read through it again, just from a different translation. I'll make some comments, and then I want to pull out three principles, or in fact, three realities about spiritual formation. Realities that are true, whether you realize it or not. So here we go, 2 Peter chapter 1. Reading from verses 1 to 11. Shimeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now let's just pause there for a second. Notice who Peter is writing to. He is writing to a group of people who he explicitly says have already obtained righteousness from God through Jesus Christ. They already have righteousness through faith. And this is critical. If we get to this foundational passage of intentionally pursuing godliness, notice these habits or this intentional pursuit is not to make you righteous in God's eyes. You are already righteous in God's eyes if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ. And you'll see Peter emphasize this again in verse 5 when he gets to the list of all the qualities we must pursue. Right in the beginning, he says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Notice supplement your faith with this virtue, this desire for godliness, right? Our pursuit, our active pursuit of spiritual formation supplements faith. It does not replace the faith you have in Jesus. That's the start. And now he's moving on. So let's 
with that in mind, let's carry on reading some verses 3 to 11. Let's have a, li- have a look at this list again, this pursuit of formation. So verse 3. Man, this is beautiful. Just reflect on these words again. His divine power, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence and by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises so that through them, guys listen to this, that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. That's the promise, and we'll get to that promise at the end. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control, steadfastness, steadfastness, godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. And in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's so much to say about this passage. But for the purpose of this series, as we kick it off, I simply want to draw out three realities about our spiritual formation. So here we go. Number one, you are being formed. Everybody, everywhere, is currently undergoing spiritual formation. Everybody. This is not just for religious people. Everyone from hardened criminals to devout believers is currently being spiritually formed. The only question is, are you being positively formed? spiritually formed or negatively spiritually formed. But you are being formed one way or the other. So Peter's words, he puts it like this in verse 4, that through these promises you may become, those beautiful words, partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption. Do you see that? You're in one of two places, escaping corruption and becoming increasingly like the divine nature godliness, either escaping corruption and growing in godliness or being corrupted and withdrawing from godliness. You are being formed. The only question is, are you undergoing positive spiritual formation or negative? You know, I find that sometimes as Christians, we we tend to see the world kind of through the lens of there's three categories of life around us. So there are godly things in life, then there's some ungodly evil things, and then there's just a whole bunch of neutral ground that's neither godly nor ungodly. So for example, uh, on the godly side of the spectrum, there's church, there's worship music, sunrises, puppies and coffee. Obviously, godly category. And then on the ungodly side of life, I mean, there is drugs, murderers, rock music, sorry, Phil, um, cats, and tea. Right, clearly, for obvious reasons, ungodly side 
of the spectrum. And then there's just this bunch of neutral territory. These things are neither godly nor ungodly. They're just like there, you know, like sports. Unless, of course, you support the All Blacks or Australia or Orlando Pirates. That's why that is clearly ungodly. So that's what we tend to think of life. There's like this lens. There's a clearly these are positive spiritual formation areas of life. We embrace those. We stay away from these. And then kind of the rest of life, like two thirds of life is just this neutral ground. However, as C.S. Lewis so famously said, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch Every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. And this is largely true. I mean, let's think about it as we look at some of the six areas that we're going to look at in the series. Right? So, for example, area of our finances and money, which we'll get to next week. I mean, money itself... Like the brand of the dollar is, is morally neutral. There's not going to be any currency in heaven. And yet we know that the love of money is the root of all evil. And that the corrupting influence of money is so destructive that even Jesus would say it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's how devastating the influence of money can be on our spiritual formation. Money is morally neutral, but its influence on us can be negative. But as we looked at just the past couple of weeks, that passage that speaks about it is God who gives the power to amass wealth in order to steward, in order to use for His kingdom. So it's morally neutral itself, but its effect on us, that's a battleground. Same things when we come to week number four, or third area of life that we'll look at in the series. When it comes to our mind, and specifically we will talk about the role of media, and social media, and what the internet age has done for us. I mean, the internet itself is morally neutral. It's not going to be any routers in heaven or in hell. I was going to make a comment about some service providers there, but we won't go there. But the negative influence of social media, of fake news, of fear-mongering is devastating. And the internet, as we know, is a repository for misinformation and every kind of wickedness. And yet... Well, here we are, the church at home, and you're watching this through the internet. So itself, it's morally neutral, but its influence on our lives, especially today, not in Daniel's day, but especially today, is a battleground. All that to say, life around us and all of the influences in it those influences are either constructive or destructive. They're either contributing to positive spiritual formation or they are deforming us. And one way or another, you are being formed. That's a spiritual reality. These, this rule of life The set of habits is designed to ensure that amidst these pressures, we are being positively spiritually formed. That's reality number one. Spiritual formation reality number two. Grace is not opposed to effort. So as a Christian, I've really wrestled a lot with this this tension of grace Because as I know, as we hope we all know, our godliness is a gift of grace. Our pursuit of godliness is on its own by grace, initiated by grace. If it's all grace, then why should I make any effort in it? It's God's going to do it. 
And if I do it, then it's me and my strength, and then it's all about me. And we, we know that, that that's against grace. And yet, in the Bible, we realize it is filled with all these imperatives and these motivations for intentionally pursuing obedience. So how do we resolve that tension? And that's where I heard this quote just many years ago that unlocked, just released all of that tension for me. And he said this, he says, grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Let me say that again. Grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. You do not earn your right standing before God by your own intentional pursuit of righteousness. You do not earn the acceptance of God by the pursuit of your own righteousness. There is no earning anything from God by any of our own efforts. That's all grace. Grace is opposed to earning, but grace is not opposed to effort, to intentionality, to a sustained, disciplined pursuit of godliness. In fact, I love Dallas Willard's definition of spiritual formation. It's so powerful. He says this, Christian spiritual formation is focused entirely on Jesus. Its goal is an obedience or conformity to Christ that arises out of an inner transformation, get this, accomplished through purposive interaction with the grace of God in Christ. I love that last those last few words, purposive interaction with the grace of God in Christ. So that's why you'll read these grace markers in Peter's passage on spiritual formation. There's clear grace markers. Apart from going to those who've already obtained righteousness, apart from supplement your faith, there's grace markers. So in verse 3 to 4, it says, His divine power has granted to us grace, given it, gift, by which He has granted to us his precious and great promises. Those are grace markers throughout this passage. These are interactions with grace. But there's also clearly in Peter's passage, purposive. I did not even know that that was an adjective until I came across this passage again. Purposive. Notice here, verse 5. For this very reason, make every, guys read it, effort. Verse 10, therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling. For if you practice these qualities, so clearly in this passage, grace is not opposed to effort. And this just makes real life sense. I mean, beyond all of that and the tension and the theological difficulties, I think we all know and have all experienced the truth that godliness does not happen by accident. Am I right? Nobody accidentally became more like Jesus. Just like, huh, where did that? Godliness, we just know that. It doesn't happen by accident, but through purposive interactions with grace. That's rule of life. Purposive interactions the grace of God. All right, number three. Third, spiritual formation reality. It'll take some convincing. Habits are your friend. Habits are your friends. So I'm a, I've shared this with you before, I'm a routine guy. I love rhythm and routine, but I realize not everybody's like that. And for some of you, habits and this word rule sounds just really restrictive. Well, I want you to consider this. This truth, much like the reality that spiritual formation is happening, whether you realize it or not, there is the truth or the reality that habits are forming and shaping you even now, whether you like it or not. Here's what I mean. The reality is we all live every day mainly by habit. 
So a habit is really just something, a behavior that happens automatically, that's happening in the background subconsciously. That's a habit. The truth is that we live our lives mainly by habit. So a study by Duke University suggests that as much as 40% of our actions that we take every day are not the products of conscious choice, but habit. Let me say that again. 40% of every action we make every day is the product of subconscious habit, not conscious choice. That's a whole bunch of our lives that's just happening on automatic in the background, which is a good thing, by the way. That's how we are designed, right? We do not have the RAM capacity, or let me speak for myself here, the RAM capacity to fully make and decide the thousands of decisions that we have to make every single day. Some of those decisions have to be mechanized, and that saves us a lot of energy for important things, which is why I eat almost the exact same breakfast every day, the same sort of habits of lunch, because my RAM is limited, and I want to free up that for far more important things, for a different set of clothing for every day of the week. That was a joke. I don't quite go that far. So some things have to be mechanized in our lives to save us energy for more important thinking. That's why it probably has happened to you if you drive a car that you're like driving on your way home after work and you arrive home, you're like, man, how did I get here? Like you don't remember consciously making all those decisions to turn. Because why? Because you were thinking about that relational problem in your life or that work situation. Your brain is being put to better use than exactly what route you are going to take. So habits are active in our lives and they're our friends. They enable us to apply our thinking in, in ways that are important, but there is a danger. So it begs the question, how much is going on in the background of our lives? How many habits are contributing negatively to our spiritual formation, are corrupting us, and it's equally happening in the background, and we don't even know that it's going on? which is why part of the series is a habit audit. And so, for example, we're going to unlock in that uh, third aspect of life we get to our un subconscious use of our phones in our lives and how that may be contributing to decisions that we make to our formation but without even realizing it. All that to say habits are shaping and forming us, whether you realize it or not. If we don't acknowledge this, we can fall prey to bad habits. But when we acknowledge this, we can put that to good use to the way it's designed in order to build this kind of structure in our lives that makes sure, that makes sure we are being positively spiritually formed. Interesting, rule of life. We debated about whether to keep that title because rule sounds so restrictive. But rule comes from the Latin word regula, R-E-G-U-L-A, which means a trellis. Trellis is that like wooden structure that you build in your garden to allow plants to grow so nicely on it. Right? So habits is like that, this structure, this trellis that can contribute positively to spiritual formation. But we've got to know it's there and maintain and shape it. Ultimately, I'll say this. The combination of habits, of rhythms, or disciplines coupled with this motivation for godliness, for transformation, that combination, it's necessary for sustaining us, sustaining us in our pursuit of spiritual formation. And I say that because isn't that really the challenge? Sustaining, sustaining a pursuit to be positively shaped as a Christian. So Eugene Peterson, who so famously repurposed the atheistic philosopher Immanuel Kant's phrase to describe Christianity, he's called it an obedience, a long obedience in the same direction. Christianity is a long obedience in the same direction. He also said this, he said, it doesn't take much 
to generate an interest in Christianity or in Jesus, what's harder is to sustain it. And isn't that true? I mean, I know that you're interested in positive spiritual formation. So that's why you're, you're watching this. I mean, deep down inside, you're interested in growing in godliness or at least escaping the corruption that is in the world, in becoming who you were made to be and who Christ died in order to enable you to become. You want that. And believe me, it would be very easy to get you all hyped up about that. Harp is easy. Generating interest is easy. In Christianity today, modern Christianity, there's a lot of harp. If you need motivation or enthusiasm, man, you can just like hit up Google and uh, YouTube and you will find plenty to generate harp. What's harder? It's not the interest, generating the interest, but sustaining it. That's why Peter adds in his list, verse 6, steadfast fastness. I think the translation Dabba read it said, said patience, but I like steadfastness a little better here because steadfastness, the root of it is simply this, stick to itiveness, stick to itiveness. That's what steadfastness is. Christianity today is not lacking in interest, but what is often lacking today is follow through, a determined, disciplined, sustained pursuit of more of Jesus in our lives. That's what the series is about. And if you missed it at the end, here, here's what's at stake. Here's the reward. Verse 8, I'll read it from another translation, third translation for you this morning. For if these things are really yours, these characteristics of godliness, if they're really yours and are continually increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective or unproductive in your pursuit of knowing our Lord Jesus Christ more intimately. So do you want these qualities to increase in your life? Do you want to be effective and productive in your pursuit of knowing Jesus more intimately? Well, then stay tuned for the next six weeks and commit together as we join as a community in Rule of Life 2021. Let's pray. God, I do ask you this morning that as we consider this passage, Lord Jesus, that you would stir up by your Holy Spirit within us a genuine interest, a genuine passion, a genuine desire for this year to grow in godliness, to escape the corruption in the world because of sinful desire. We know it's there because we felt it in so many aspects of our lives and this great precious promises of becoming partakers of the divine nature. God, we know there's a way of life that's far more stable in these uncertain times that flourishes despite all the uncertainty and that is fruitful. That we can live the kind of life that you died to purchase for us. Holy Spirit, as I pray just across the city of Joburg or people watching from around the country or even other parts of the world, stir within us a genuine desire for transformation. And God, warn us and we know the reality <laughs> of the obstacles we face in the world, worldly culture, in our own flesh and the devil himself. And God, as a church this year, would you help us build together, together as a community, a trellis, a structure that will enable us as your children living here in Joburg, be fortified in our faith and even positively formed. Sustain us this year as we journey for your sake, for your glory, to know you 
more intimately our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.